Hey Soph, it's great to have you here today. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Great to be here. You are in sunny Australia right now. What part of Oz do you live? So I'm in central west New South Wales, a town called Orange. We're about four hours west of Sydney. Right. Okay. And it's your summer, isn't it, at the minute? It is. It is evening at the moment, but it's still quite warm. So we've had lovely days at the moment. So mm -hmm. no complaints here. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I know Soph uh, quite recently, actually. Soph and myself are part of the Ultimate Contribution, which I've mentioned a couple of times on previous podcasts. And um, it's all about becoming a coach and helping people and, and helping people uh, get their focus back and you know some people are going through a lot of confusion or chaos and don't really know what to do with their life that's where ultimate contribution really helps people and um, so that's how I've met Sophie but Sophie's also runs her own business a digital marketing business so I thought it would be great to get Sophie on because I know Sophie is definitely somebody that hasn't settled for second best she's a she's a real powerhouse from what I've seen so far um, and is superwoman I think how many children have you got? Three. Three children. It's just beyond crazy for me because I've only got one son and he's now 21. Uh, but you've got three young children. You run your own business and you've started your coaching business. So, um, yeah. Uh, and you recently moved house as well. So, um, yeah. So I, I wanted to get Sophie on because she's a real go-getter, very driven person. And I thought the, the insight that Sophie could give to the listeners would be... Um, really really valuable in terms of anybody that feels stuck in a career or, or or stuck in any part of life so so over to you so do you want to just give us a bit of a, um, a bit of a backstory of how you sort of where you came from really in terms of before you started your business and what made you you know all of a sudden start your own business yeah well thanks first for inviting me along it's um a topic i love to talk about so i'm um, happy to be here um I think I've always felt like I was going to do my own thing at some point. I just never knew what it was going to look like. Um, but the catalyst for me was um, after the birth of my second son, um, I was working, I had been working in a big advertising agency in Sydney um, and they rang and said, we're making a whole lot of redundancies. And at the moment your role is part of that. Um, but they were hesitant to, to pull the trigger until I was closer to coming back. And I was like, please just let me go. I was ready to have a reason to step away from that world because I just knew even towards the end of being there with um, during my last pregnancy that I, I was ready to do something else. What um, job, sorry, so what job was that? Yeah, so I was um, a resource manager at a big a digital advertising agency. So I was in charge of resourcing all the projects there. Prior to that, I'd also worked client side at Lexus, managing all their digital marketing. So I'd been working um, both client and agency side in different capacities for probably about um, about eight years at that point um, since I'd come back from London. So. Um, so it was a very busy job, even having one, I was working four days a week in the office, plus all the extra hours that come with working in a big agency like that. So I was ready to sort of stop that. It was not very mummy friendly at all. Um, but I do love to have my own thing. As, as you mentioned, I'm, I am very driven. I do like to work. Um, being a full-time mum was never something I saw myself doing. And I do think I'm a better mum when I'm working. Um, so I was really happy when they finally went, yep, yeah, no, you know, here's your redundancy and, and off you go. And then I, you know, I wanted to look for another position and I started looking around and I just found you had to compromise so much. If I wanted to do work I was really passionate about and really um, driven to do, I couldn't have the flexibility I wanted um, to get the flexibility and, and proximity to, to home so that I wasn't getting home late at night. I had to take a much lower paying job um, with a lot, you know, less responsibility and, and a lot less involvement in um, whatever industry or business I was going to do. And I took the lower paying job in the part time capacity close to home because I was like, you know, I, I wanted to be with the boys. Um, but honestly, within weeks, like I, I just was like, what am I doing? <laughs> they must have thought they hit the jackpot with me because they were looking <laughs> for someone to just help with a bit of um, 
uh, operational stuff within the business and they got, you know, I could do marketing and all everything for them. Um, and I had been having conversations with a few different people over the sort of previous six months that had just sort of started planting some seeds in my head that, you know, why couldn't I take the skills I had and do something with that? Because I always thought if I was going to start my own business, it had to be product based. Don't know why, where that thought um, came from, but I could never, I was like, well, there was nothing I was ever passionate about enough to go, well, I want to do that. And so over, look, honestly, only a short period of time, I was talking to another um, girl who was in a similar situation and we decided to partner up and, and start something. And we both definitely had skills um, that complement each other. And so I think I'd been there three and a half months when I handed in my resignation and I thought, well, if I'm working part-time and earning less money anyway, why not give this a really good go? Um, and, and so that was, that was five years ago this March that I did that. Um, and look, that first year was hard. It was really hard. Um, things didn't work out with the girl that I partnered with. I was a lot more focused and a lot more driven than she was. Um, she wasn't, you know, um, she said all the, the right things, but she just wasn't showing up the way I needed her to show up. And I thought, well, if I'm carrying it the weight anyway, why don't I try and do this on my own? And interestingly enough, the conversation I had with her that ended that business partnership was just before I went to um, my version of the Ultimate Contribution workshop. Um, so that was at the end of 2016. Um, and that was a game changer for me. That, that it, the work that I did at that only supported the journey going forward. Um, and, and so the next year I just put, you know, my focus in putting myself out there and some key clients built my confidence, constantly looking to learn more, um, had my third child in that next year as well, my little girl. So she's three now. Um, and it was probably after I, I can't look, I took um, a period off with after I had her and it was probably after I came back after her that I went, okay, this is it. And I really put a lot in, I rebranded and I really started to push myself out there and really started to um, believe in my ability. Um, and that I, and I started, and I realized that I had a unique combination of skills because I had the technical side of things that's required for doing things online and digitally. And I have a creative side, which is not often something you have. You often have website developers who just do the back end, but don't have the vision for the front end. I had user experience, um, experience, so I could, you know, step into that and things. And, and I just loved the flexibility of, being able to just drop everything if I needed to with the kids, be able to show up to the school assembly when my son started school. Um, and, and that's sort of, you know, and the business has just grown. Um, it's been 100% on referrals. Despite being in the marketing field, I've never had to market myself, which I pride myself on. Um, people are buying into working with me. So I just, you know, put myself out there. And I think that's the number one thing that sort of resonates with people is that, I'm very, um, I'm very good at communicating with clients and just people in general. And so from that, they get a really good feel of how it is to work with me. Um, and I've not had anyone yet sort of not enjoy that experience. Um, but, you know, a few things shifted. Uh, I was working from home. My husband was working 10 minutes from where we lived. We lived in Sydney. We're in a small house. Um, you know, the kids were getting older and all of a sudden it was like, hold on, something doesn't feel right here. I had the business, I had the balance. I'm like, but something's not. And I literally sat down one day to my husband and said, whose life are we living? Because I kind of feel like it's not ours because I felt like we were just going through this daily grind and living where we were meant to live and being there for, you know, family and what was expected from us. And I sort of planted a bit of a seed with him that I wanted to move out of Sydney and he was a bit hesitant because um, because his family were around us, all his friends, we lived in the part of Sydney that he had grown up in. Um, but he also saw what I, I was, you know, where I was coming from and um, 
he knows that I'm not one to to sort of give up on what I want. He's we've been together a very long time, and um, it was just over two years ago that we had come out to um, where we live now, which is where my dad lives. And even though we'd been here, you know, so many times, we came with a you know different lens on, and we're like, hold on, this kind of this kind of works, and um, and so we up sticks and moved to the country quite 18 months ago so um and you know it's been a game changer no one knew COVID was coming so to have left a tiny house in busy Sydney and come to a beautiful open space where we've been able to buy a much larger home on a much bigger block and have a better quality of life um because I really believe in you know um you don't just live to work Um, you know it's about having that balance again and and not wanting to give up and I wanted to give my kids and us more probably more importantly a quality of life where I wasn't constantly feeling like I couldn't do this so I couldn't afford that and you know we work really hard and I just felt like we could never catch our breaths in a big city and I just think um, so many people don't think they can make those changes. I know when I told people, especially people that were sort of acquaintances, but not necessarily good friends. And they'd be like, oh, oh, I'd love to do that. But oh, I I couldn't find a job there. Or, oh, I couldn't do that because I've got this or that. You know, there's always excuses for why we can't do things. When I think probably people have seen more than anything over the last year that really like, you just, there's no certainty in life. There's no, so why not just go after the things you really want? Um, And that's what I've always done. I I sort of, I feel like, you know, if we moved here and we hated it, we moved back, you know, it's not the end of the world. It was, you know, like when I traveled in my twenties, it's like, yeah, I could be at home getting married, having kids, but that will all come. I'm still confident that's all going to come, but I've got this time now to do these things now. Um, and I think really I've realized more than ever in the last few years that I've always had that desire to just live the way I want to live and not to somebody else's expectations. Um, because, you know, it could have, it would have been very easy to just go, oh, well, Richard's mum needs us close by and she's got this relationship with the kids and I was like well that's not gonna end like she'll just come visit us and surely she'll understand why we're making these choices and and people do you know true friendships last and um and starting fresh somewhere is also really nice you know being able to put yourself out there and just choose what people know about you and be the person you want them to see you to be which has been another really interesting journey um, over the last 18 months. Um, And then, so when we moved, one of the big things that I wanted to do was really start focusing more on working with people in a coaching capacity. Um, I had grand plans last year to run workshops and start that process, um, which were all uh, ended when COVID came along. But I think I've always had a passion to work with people Um, in some you know all my jobs have been been in some capacity working um, where I communicated with people a lot and I think coaching is a natural extension of that for me and and I really um, enjoy watching others find the things that light them up and and find them help them navigate those things that are a little bit challenging to get back on track with where they really want to be and um, and I guess that's my focus this year is really leaning into that work and and seeing how I can bring that in and and run it hopefully alongside my digital marketing business. Um, Because I think there's, you know, like you said, lots of people that have been in chaos this past 12 months, especially. I think there was um, a lot of people who probably thought they were in jobs that would never be affected, especially the travel industry. I have a lot of friends that work for for airlines and and things like that, who are a life to, you know, they've worked there for 20 plus years and never thought they'd have an issue who all of a sudden find themselves um, without work and very specialised skills that aren't necessarily as transferable as, as you'd hope. Um, I, yeah, but that's a little bit about where I've been and where I'm heading. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so in terms of... Um, <clears throat> so you lived in London before you got married, presumably, was that? Yes, I actually moved to London with my now husband, when I was 21, and we lived over there for nearly five years. 
came back engaged. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. So what made you go to London? Just work or wanted some new variety? For as long as I can remember, it was always going to be finish school, go to uni, go traveling. Right. It's just what I was always going to do. I can't remember a time that that wasn't my focus. Um, I had just always had a desire to travel. My mum was born in Scotland. Um, I've always had always wanted to go over there and see, you know, where she was born and things like that. And I don't know, I just, Australia is so far away from everything. And I had just, I had just watched so much um, and read so much about Europe, especially I, I really love art. So I'd read a lot about, you know, I'd studied a lot of different paintings. And, and so to me, just the idea of going and living and, and, and also like, I really, you know, high school and even uni wasn't a great time for me. I didn't really, hadn't found myself. I think others had certain opinions of who they thought I was. And I was ready to sort of just step away from all that and step away from the drama of family and, and all that, that that period in your life can create. Um, and, and just going, yeah, somewhere like London just sounded great. And initially I was always going and then I met Richard and we decided to go together, um, but I would have always gone, I think. Uh, and yeah, went for what was meant to initially be two years and then we were going to go to Canada and then we just had, were settled and loved London. We're doing so much traveling. We just stayed and then we did a big six months in a camper van around Europe before we came home um, of just, you know, like a month in Italy and a month in Spain and Portugal and, you know, as all the Aussies do when they're over there and, um, and just really enjoyed it before we came home and became grown proper grown ups, I guess, and got you know, yeah, all that sort of stuff started. <laughs> well, that that's wonderful. I I had plans to travel after uni, and I met my um, to become Jake's dad, um, and joined a band actually um, in the March in the year I was graduating. I joined a band and met Aid, who's Jake's dad. Um, and then when I graduated, which was in the July, <clears throat> because me and him were new relationship and all the rest of it, and I just joined a band, I didn't do it. And um, mm. yeah, I've, I've always been gutted that I never did it, but everything happens for a reason. And I've, it's still in me now to do it. Um, you know, getting this business, this coaching business that can be run from anywhere, you know, is really yeah. appealing because I've still got a desire to travel. Um, I mean, I'm now in a relationship and he, Matt is um, in a nine to five, if you like, but he's not, he's not happy in a nine to five. You know, he's got, he, he's going through his own, I wouldn't call it chaos, but navigating what he wants out of life. And I, yeah. think, I think he's quite early in that journey. Um, so like, as part of me that thinks, you know, when, this craziness stops with the with the no traveling and everything I'm like hmm but I don't know how it would work so there's always something like you said people have always got reasons to not do things and and I think I've been very guilty of that over the years so it's good that you it's good that you stuck to your guns and, and you were going anyway you know and Richard just decided to come with you which was brilliant you know because he could have turned around and said it's not for me love and and I, I, I remember we had that conversation because we'd been friends for quite for about a year when we got together and it was kind of like, well, do we just have a bit of fun and you go do your thing, I do mine? Do we not do anything? Do we see how it goes for a few months and go together? And, and um, I think both of us quite early on knew it was a fairly special relationship um, and what we're eight, 18 odd years in now. So, um, you know... I, and I think, you know, I know a lot of friends that have traveled together like we did and didn't make it. And it is that experience is something you either grow together in doing or it does send you on different parts. And I'm very grateful that we got to do it together. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, I look back now and I can see that I've always had these traits of not wanting to to settle and not putting up with things that didn't make me happy. Like I remember walking away from a job um, and the person that I was working with was like, what do you mean you're leaving? Like, they were like, but you know, this is, and I was like, well, no, this isn't a priority for me right now. This isn't 
helping me get to where I want to be. I understand that you would love me to stay, but that's not serving me. And that was me at a at 22, 21, 22. So that's all, you know, being there, I just didn't obviously understand the, you know, what it all meant. Um, and and it, it's, it showed up multiple times in my life. Mm. Um, and I think, I think becoming her mum has, has, has proven challenging a little bit because you can't, um, you can't have that, freedom in the same way you've got other people that are so you know especially when my kids are eight six and three so they're all very very much still reliant on me um you know as much as rich is a very hands-on dad they want mum um and I struggle with that sometimes I have to admit you know like there, there are times that it's just like I just need some space I just need these things that fill my cup and the you know and it and for me to be a better mum you know, finding that balance of making sure I'm doing those things for me. And that's probably um, something I, it's going to constantly challenge me. Um, but I do know that when I do things, when I get into my work and I, and I get that balance that, you know, that, that chaos, you know, uh, it drops away um, and I'm up, able to show up in better ways. But, you know, I know <laughs> when my eldest, when we were moving, he really struggled with, but why would we leave the house that he, the only home he'd known? Why would he leave his friends? Why would we leave, you know, our family? And I, and I you know, and I tried to really be honest with him and have conversations with him about the fact that, you know, sometimes you have to make, you know, decisions that might feel hard at the time, but the outcome. And now once we bought our new house and he saw why we were doing and he's old enough to understand he's very bright he can he can appreciate it now and I even say to him do you get what mommy and daddy were trying to achieve now because I think it's really important to communicate that to kids um because it helps them to understand why why we do what we do um and that we're only ever trying to better all our lives um ideally but um <laughs> it's interesting but, isn't yeah. it because I think it's a really <clears throat> excuse me a really important point because when I was you know when my son was was little um, I was a single mom you know me and his dad didn't last and um and I was working full time I had I, you know I've got great family that helped me whenever I needed it you know and without that I'd have really struggled um but what I do remember is constantly feeling guilty for being out you know five days a week working for always chasing my tail, for him having to go to wraparound club at, at school, you know, um, and then feeling guilty if I wanted to go out of a weekend, you know, on a Saturday night or whatever, because mm. I've been out all week at work and God, now I want to go out and have a few drinks with some friends. And it's just, it was just relentless. The guilt I used to feel was relentless. And like you said, if you feel that way, you're you're impacting how you're being with your children because mm. you know and I mean I wasn't I, I can't say I was hard done to I had a lot of support and all the rest of it but it was it was a challenge it was working full-time being a single mom is a challenge um but nobody really tells you or nobody told me anyway it's okay to be kind to yourself now it's okay mm. to go and have a drink with your friends if you want to Whereas what I was getting was, well, aren't you being a bit selfish? You know, and it's like, it's really tough. It's really tough. Um, and it's only now, you know, in my forties and Jake's 21 now and he's very independent and, and all the rest of it. And, and I think, well, I didn't do too bad a job because he's a very, very good lad. You know, he's lovely. Everybody's always complimented me on, on Jake. Um, and he, some of the conversations we have, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination and I annoy him at times, but um, he, he does appreciate me and he does appreciate what I've done and what I've created, um, mm -hmm. knowing that I didn't really get much support from his dad, you know, financially and everything else. So, um, so that's really satisfying. But it, when you're in the thick of it, you're just berating yourself all the time for 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 how dare I spend time on myself you know when I've got this little 
wonderful thing that needs all my attention. So yeah, it's really important. And I, I've got a very good friend who's a single mom at the moment. Her, she's got the one child. He's uh, the same age as my middle one. And, and I can, you know, I'll often listen to her and she'll be like, this is so hard. And da, da, da. And I said, I say to her sometimes, you won't know this as a single parent. Like, it's hard whether you're a single parent or not. And I think she thinks sometimes, gosh, is this because I'm a single? I'm like, it is not because you're a single mom. Parenting is just hard. Yeah. I'm just lucky that I've got someone to tag out sometimes with. Um, but you know, then she's got one and I've got three. So sometimes I don't, can't even tag out because there's three of them and two of you. Um, but I still even, I, I apologize for wanting time to myself, which is just silly. Like he says to me, don't like, you don't need to apologize. Just go and take a moment for yourself. You know, um, you do so much. And I just think that we just, especially at, I don't know if it's this generation or whatever, that we just you know, we just feel like it's never enough. You know, we, you, 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 if you work, you're not there enough with the kids. If you're there with the kids as a full-time parent, it's like, well, what are you contributing? You know, like there's just, you can't win. You can't win. All you can do is survive. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm very aware of just try and, you know, educate the kids on the fact that, there's a you know why I'm doing what I'm doing I think especially because I am always there and I work for home they they sometimes question why I can't just be there with them yeah and it's and it's and that's probably one of the biggest challenges because I started my business when my eldest was three so he doesn't remember mum and and the year before that I was on maternity leave so you know, he's only had it in his whole life. He's had a year, probably about a year and a half where I worked for outside of the home um, in a very stressful job. And he won't remember that. Mm. So as far as they know, mum's just there. Mum's always there. She's always going to pick everything up. She's always going to sort everything out. And I love that that's how they are. But at the same time, sometimes I'm like, guys, mommy needs to earn some money <laughs> I'm like people pay me for doing this um and that lets me pay for stuff for you and so I don't also you know mix words about that because I think that they need to understand you know why we do what we do and and how that affects them um and if they want to do you know soccer and they want to do swimming lessons or they want to do all these things they've got to let mum do some stuff too um and, and that can be challenging, especially if you want to do calls at night and things, they just want you and, and stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, you make it work. And, and that's the thing, when you're really passionate about what you want to do, um, you make it work in a way that works for everyone. Um, and I think that's what I'm really grateful for because, you know, I think um, just over a year ago when we moved, I spent the first few months just getting all the kids settled and then I was just about to ramp up sort of putting myself out there um, and get more projects and because I, I rely um, on interacting with people a lot and that's you know how I've met a lot of my clients all of a sudden I couldn't do any of that and I didn't know that many people and I was like oh should I just go get a job because like I'm I'm very employable um, should I just go get a job and I thought, no, like I haven't put in the hard yards to compromise now. Like I just need to lean into what I know works for me. And that's what I did. And even in everything shutting down, I managed to get new clients. And you only need that one that leads on to another one that leads on to, you know, like you just, yeah, it was a bit slower, but given it was, you know, we were in lockdown here and everything, the fact that I was still working I was so incredibly grateful for. Um, and that was a good lesson in, you know, um, how much I wanted this, you know, because I was like, if ever there was a time to sort of throw in the towel and I thought, no, I haven't worked this hard to give up now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this next 12 months is going to look to be my biggest yet and it will only just grow from there and, um uh, but I know it's not for everyone. I know not everyone has the drive. I know not everyone has the, you know, not everyone can work for themselves. It does take discipline. Um, but I think if you are willing to put in the time and the effort, um, you can do, you know, whatever you want, really. And I, and I teach my kids that, that if you yeah. really want it, 
go after it. Yeah, we definitely. Try. Um, yeah. And if the path changes, you know, I found that when my business partner and I split, I could have very easily used that as an opportunity to just throw in the towel and say, this isn't for me. Um, and interestingly, she didn't stay working for herself. She went back to employment. And she obviously just wasn't the kind of person that could be self-employed. Um, and I think that was good that we realised that sooner rather than later. Um, <clears throat> when you, um, so before you started your business, you got made redundant. That's right, isn't yes. it? That's what you said. Yeah. Um, was there, because I know people listening to this will be like, well, you know, maybe she'd got a nice big package so she could start herself off in business or maybe, you know, because she's got a husband. So there was that safety blanket there and all that. What, what was your situation? Was it a case of that, that, you know, your husband said, yeah, go for it. And I'm right behind you. Or, you know, did you have a safety net to get this business going? Or was it quite tough for you as well? So I had a supportive husband, which was incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, in my industry, thankfully, I didn't need startup money. Yeah. All I needed was a laptop and I was good to go. Um, I, I went into, I actually explored the SFM and DEA. Um, I don't know if you've talked about that much on here. So I, what I did have in my redundancy went into that. Um, the DEA was very much where my focusing was at. And I learned a lot from that. Um, I never really had a great desire to be an affiliate marketer, but I really got a lot out of the masterminding side of it. Um, so that was where my redundancy went. So that wasn't there. There was no safety net. Um, uh, you know, I think my husband, I remember he got a bonus at work and he let me use it to buy a laptop. <laughs> um, I went and bought a very nice uh, Mac so that I had, you know, and, and that's all I needed, thankfully. Um, mm. I think a lot of industries, obviously, you do need lots of different things to start I just needed my skills um, and a laptop so um, but I think having been on mat leave twice by then I had learned to we'd learned to live on a lot less yeah um, and I think that I think if I had known back when we were double income no kids how little we could live off. Oh my God, we wish we could go back and save so much. Hey, yeah. um, but you know, like I wouldn't change it because you know, we loved going out. We, we love food, we love going out. We loved going to concerts and stuff and I wouldn't change that for the world. But it makes you realize once you um, have to live on a lot less, where you spent all that money and we often will say, do you remember when we didn't have kids? What did we do with all our time? Like, <laughs> I just, um, and so, yeah, so that, I, I, look, I think the only safety net we maybe had was that we knew we could go to, you know, family if we really got stuck. Um, but I, we didn't need to. And my husband doesn't earn loads of money. He'd only changed careers a few years earlier. So he was working his way back. He'd gone from like a management um, level job in hospitality to, a, you know, requalifying and going into engineering as a designer so he had gone, he'd start, gone back to the bottom. So um, I think, look, don't get me wrong. I worried about money a lot. And I think um, it was hard. Um, and I know that when we considered having our third child, that was a big thing. And I was like, well, I don't want to not have a child because our current circumstances aren't amazing because I know that they will be, great again and we're already you know we're managing we've always managed we've never gone you know we thankfully have never been a, you know people who have not been bad with money so we've always managed um, and I'm so glad we did because the decisions that we were then able to make in the last two years moving out of a big Sydney city like Sydney we bought well we sold well you know like being smart in other ways has allowed us to I guess leapfrog a few things um and I think if you're of the mindset of of being a you know being able to just 
think outside your box. Like, you know, a lot of people said to us when we moved, oh, are you moving because your husband's got a job? Now, no, that was the one thing that we didn't have for him. Like I knew that I was confident with my business. I said to him, look, the one thing I can't do, I can look at schools, I can find how, how much houses are, I can do all that sort of stuff, but I can't find your job. You need to go out and call some people and, and see what the go is. And he's one of, I swear to God, one of the luckiest people when it comes to jobs. <laughs> he made a couple of phone calls. Um, he had been very lucky. He'd worked for some really good firms in Sydney and just off the back of that, and he's very good at what he does. Um, he he literally rang a company and they were like, yeah, we totally, like they don't get people just going, oh, we want to move to where you are. Um, so he, he got it, but that again, like you could just sit, you know, often people are like, oh, I've been looking and they haven't found any jobs. I'm like, well, be proactive, right? Don't wait for it to come to you. Another example, I said, think about the companies that you know are out there that you'd like to work for, call them, email them, follow them up. You know, he did need me to encourage him. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, he, he did it. Um, and it just sort of reinforced that we were going in the right direction as well, that we were making a change. And he actually earns more living out here than he did in Sydney, ah. which is just, he earns what you'd work earn in the city, which is just silly that we earn less slightly further out. Um, but he chose not to travel the hour and a half to the city every day um, there and back. But yeah, so, you know, like I think sometimes people think they have set ideas of what things are going to be like if they change things up when really the reality isn't isn't what they think at all yeah. um, and where we are in in Australia has been very unaffected by everything that's happened in the last 12 months because of that because of the reasons that people are here and the kind of different work that people do here um, probably the biggest hit was hospitality because we are in a beautiful um, winery area Mm -hmm. um, so all the cellar doors, all the restaurants, all that had to shut down. So that is a big part of our community. But everyone got behind it and did takeout and bought, you know, a case of wine instead of going to a winery. And so everyone got behind it in different ways, um, which was lovely. But, yeah, I just think that that was another example of, you know, all we had to do was try and it all just fell into place. Um, How did you, um, yeah. I'm always interested when people start their own business because it's it's that scary going from a, a guaranteed income to, to nothing to begin with. Um, so how did you actually get your first paying clients? My very first paying client commented on a local community <laughs> Facebook group that she was looking for someone to help her redesign her website. Uh, so this is my first independent client. My very first client with my business partner was someone she knew from school, a mum, and we did a heap of work for her. We did quite a lot of work. Um, but I don't, like, as much as she was my first client, she wasn't my first cold client. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my first client on my own and my first cold client, yeah, she commented, she put a post on a local um, community Facebook group and I commented and said, I can help. I'd love to have a conversation with you. We had a phone call. That led to a meeting and that led to a lot of work. So I worked almost solely for her in the first year because she had so much that she wanted to do. And I was pregnant and I didn't have a great pregnancy, so I couldn't work as much as I would normally. So that worked really well. And then I had other bits and pieces in between. I'll, I think those first few were, um, you know, I like I would have a conversation with a friend and they might be, oh, you know, talk to this person. Um, and then once I helped a couple of people, if there was, a, you know, I remember there was another one and um, someone commented on a Facebook post and recommended me. And I'd have friends do that who hadn't necessarily worked with me, but they'd be like, I'll oh, have a chat to Sophie. And then once I got on the phone, very rarely did I not do the work. So my conversion rate was very high. Um, I think I've only had two clients that I've not done the work for. One, I actually walked away from him because I was like, if you're hard to deal with in this early process, you're going to be a nightmare to deal with once we've got a project going. And the other one, I think they're just not ready. I think they'll come back, to be honest. It was only recently. Um, 
so yeah I think um and then probably the real momentum in the last um two years has been someone knowing someone who recommends me or very much me being proactive so for instance the other day I was chatting to a client that I did a project for before Christmas I actually got that project because I went to them to get them to create content for another client when we and they had done some work for another client of mine and when I went to catch up with them to just meet them they're like oh you didn't look at our website did you and I'm like of course I looked at your website and they're like oh we need to sort that out and I'm like well you know and then they worked with me they loved working with me and they're like totally do it so and then they made a comment oh we've got this client you should really speak to him and rather than waiting for them to tell that client to come to me I just found his details called him and had that conversation I've got a meeting with him on Wednesday so I'm very proactive you know I I don't believe that you just sit and wait everything to come to you like there's people who just you know like you could do that but you're not going to grow and you're not going to sort of um, attract who you really want to attract and luckily I've never really had people come to me that haven't fit within my ideal client they've sort of that because it has been referrals um, they get uh, they get where the value of working with someone like me um, cuz often i say to people there are people out there that are more expensive than me there are people that are cheaper than me but if you want to work with me this is how much it is to work with me and i've never had anyone come back and question that which has been great but i i have had to be very confident about it because i think you have to know your value and i think especially in those early days you can want to like go in cheap yeah. to just get the work yeah. um and look I did charge a lot less at the beginning but that was probably more to do with my confidence in my ability yeah. as soon as I got that confidence and I knew I knew what I was doing to a different level because although I had a strong skill set I still had to reskill I still was always you know learning new things um and now I know I'm good now you know I, you know, there was a couple of projects I took on last year that were fixing other people's bad work because I know I'm good. Um, and I think, but that has only come with time and it was a little bit of fake it till you make it, right? Yeah. You have to have the confidence of projecting what you want to be seen at uh, as otherwise, um, if you doubt your, you know, your ability, why should your clients or potential clients have confidence in your ability? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'm having a bit of that myself, you know, I mean, the, the ultimate contribution, that's a fixed price, you know, that's somebody else's, you know, um, developed that. But when I'm thinking about what I'm going to be charging for just one-on-one -on -one sessions or whatever, then I'm like, Oh, well, God, what is it? You know? And, and when you haven't actually done that yet in a professional capacity, it's like, like you said, you, you're cheap. You, you go cheap, but you shouldn't, should you? No. And also just because you're charging one person something doesn't mean you can't charge someone else different, right? So you've also got to read your audience. So um, not so much in my digital marketing work because I do do that more based on the time, effort. You know, I have rates that I use for different work and I do have a scale because there is other some things that take a lot more knowledge and experience to do than other tasks so I, I charge higher for that I think though when it comes to um, certainly my coaching stuff if I know I sort of try and meet where my clients at as much as where my ability is at because you know if I know this person can't afford x but I can still, do, you know, I'm still happy to deliver the quality, you know, my level of coaching at that. But then I also know someone could be here. I'm not going to not charge that person higher because I'm charging this person lower, you know, like, and, and if there's rolling fees as well, I'll put up my pricing for some, for new people coming in, but I might leave someone on the original pricing, you know, like if there's loyalty there, I'll re reward that maybe. Yeah. Um, but then if new people are coming in, you know, I think people don't review their pricing enough. Mm. Um, I review my pricing every six months. I don't always put it up every six months, but I put it up a minimum of every 12 months. Um, and I don't think people do that enough. And it doesn't have to be a massive increase, but just putting up five or 10% is, 
every little bit counts and people don't question it. Like I remember I, I never used to charge for project management, but I'd spend so much time emailing people or calling them to follow things up. And so I just started putting project management on as a standard thing. And depending on the budget of the project, it would I'd work out roughly how much time. And existing clients didn't even question it. I thought for sure clients that I had been working with for a while who had not had it on there would, but you know, I just had a short description of what it covered and no one ever questioned it. Um, I used to give a user manual and not charge for that. Now I charge for, you know, like little things like that. Um, knowing my value, um, is really important and and valuing my time and not giving too much away for free. You know, you need to give enough, but you also need people to value your time enough to respect it. Um, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it, you're not gonna, you're gonna end up just doing so much for free. Um, um, thank you, Soph, that was, that was really insightful. So I always like to close off these interviews um, asking, because there'll be people listening to this um, thinking that they would love to start their own business or, um, or maybe it's just, ju just changing jobs, but they feel trapped, you know, and, or feel like they can't move on or, or whatever it might be. But if somebody was thinking that they really, you know, they're worth more than they are living right now, what would you give them as a sort of first step, if you like, if you sort of relate it back to how you were feeling and what you did, but what, what do you think would be an easy way for somebody to go from feeling stuck and trapped to making a bit of progress? Ooh. I am a big believer in verbalizing what you want. So literally start talking about what you actually want to be doing and putting it out there is always a good start because one, not only will you start, you know, living into it more, but quite often if you then start having conversations with people, you never know what's going to show up. Um, I know for me, you know, I didn't talk about this much, but when I first came back from London, I fell into office management roles and I was very good at that, but it, I got stuck and I couldn't get out. And I was like, I don't want to be doing this. I want to be in marketing. I want to be doing more, more than this. And I remember having a conversation with the recruiter and he's like, you need to write your CV for the, the jobs that you want to have rather than the jobs you've had. Right. And it's just making conscious shifts, right? So just talking about the things you want to talk about, or what you want to actually be known for, right? So whether it's on your CV and you need to adjust what you've got there to have more of a focus on what you want to be doing and less on what you have been doing, um, and, and yeah, and, and just verbalizing it. I think for me, just p talking about it, I, I just sort of went, what, why am I not doing this? And I started asking me, myself all these questions like, okay, what's the worst case scenario if, if I do this, right? Okay. I do it. It doesn't work. I go get another job. I'd always been able to find work. I'd been lucky in that regard. Um, but I sort of went through the worst case scenarios and I really realized that, there was no, nothing to lose from trying, right? But it was like, well, if it does work, what can I get? Um, and I think, you know, I at first looked at doing it as a side hustle. And for me, that didn't work. But I had two small kids and I know that I'm an all-in kind of person. I wanted to give it, if I was going to do it, I wanted to give it everything I could. Um, and look, don't get me wrong, having a partner who had a full-time income help that scenario. But there, I do believe there are other ways to work around it. You know, like, does it mean that you have to sacrifice something in your life? Does it mean going from living alone to having someone live with you? Does it mean giving up something you love for a period to take that money and put it, funnel it into, you know, a new opportunity? Um, and worst case scenario, it doesn't work. You go back to what you were doing. But you've yeah. you've lost nothing, but you've gained so much. Um, so yeah, I'm always I'm just a try. Just put it out there and try, yeah. um, and and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. Because when you say something, you can't take it back. It's always there, isn't it? Lingering. And um, yeah, it's really powerful. That is. Thank you. 
Um, so, so if people wanted to find out more about you, obviously you do your digital marketing, um, you do your coaching, where's the best place for them to find you? Well, I'm just building my new websites, but they should be live soon. So um, sophiedurham.com is going to where you'll find out a bit more about me and my coaching. And there'll also be links to my business, digitalwonder.com.au. So, um, and I'm on Facebook and Instagram and things, but the websites probably have got the, the best info and the way to get in touch. If anyone wants any, you know, advice, when it's a chat, just wants to ask some questions, always happy to connect with anyone. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know it's evening over there um, and you've got three little ones probably wanting your attention. So I do appreciate it. It's been a lovely hour with you. Um, and I know I know the listeners are going to get a lot of value out of what you've shared. So thank you very much, Soph. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Good. See you soon. <laughs>